Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Seitz. It is Thursday, 24 hours from now, maybe 12 hours from now. Uh, Tanji Brown-Jackson will be a member of the United States Supreme Court. The, the U.S. Senate will vote. I think it's a fair bet that it will be, well, that's something like 53, 47. Uh, so uh, there is that. And of course, uh, we're getting more, like it feels like every hour that we're getting more news, uh, what's happening and what is not happening in, with Russia and Ukraine. So to dive right into all of that, we are fortunate enough to uh, welcome back our good friend, Tom Nichols, who joins us for the first time as a private citizen. So what's that yes. like? Ex-professor. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, there will be no disclaimers. Everything I say represents the view of everyone. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, digging it. Okay, so I mean, so basically in the past, because you were a professor at the War College, you always had to drop in that disclaimer that when you said something about nuclear weapons, you were not speaking on behalf of the federal government or the War College, you were speaking on on your own behalf. And and now you're a free agent. So I am. So, so I am. So, I'm a private citizen and you can uh, you can all keep your angry phone calls to the Defense Department to yourselves. Okay, so let's start with a little, uh, a few sound bites uh, from yesterday's House hearing. Uh, the House of Representatives voted on near party line vote. I think everybody, uh, no one was surprised by this, uh, to make a criminal contempt referral to the Justice Department for Dan Scavino and Peter Navarro. Dan Scavino being uh, D Donald Trump's, uh, one of his social media guys, sort of a taxpayer funded troll. Uh, Peter Navarro, um, the completely guano shit crazy uh, economic advisor who actually wrote a book about describing how he had developed the, I don't know, what he called the Green Bay Sweep um, uh, approach to uh, pulling off a coup. Anyway, they uh, refused to testify before the January 6th committee. Uh, the committee has voted to hold them in contempt. So there was a vote and there was the usual debate. Uh, Liz Cheney, uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives yesterday, um, explaining some of the issues. And I particularly liked her comments about Rudy Giuliani and about the great legal minds behind this attempt to overturn the election. Here's Liz Cheney. The election claims made by Donald Trump were so frivolous and so unfounded that the president's lead lawyer did not just lose these cases, he lost his license to practice law. The New York Supreme Court found, quote, there is uncontroverted evidence that Mr. Giuliani communicated demonstrably false and misleading statements to courts, lawmakers, and the public at large in his capacity as lawyer for former President Donald J. Trump and the Trump campaign in connection with Trump's failed effort at reelection in 2020. We haven't heard much of Rudy lately, have we, Tom? <laughs> no. Uh, and, you know, I can't say that I miss him, but it does seem like he's uh, he's gone, you know, into Witsec or something, and he's uh, somewhere in the Midwest, uh, and his name now is Bill Smith. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, I think there's, there's a guy working behind a counter at a 7-Eleven, you know, <laughs> you know, with, with with like hair dye dripping down the side of his face. <laughs> you go, hey, didn't you used to be somebody? <laughs> no, no, not me, not me. Yeah, he's he's um he's working the counter with uh, Saul Goodman at a Cinnabon in Nebraska. Okay. That was the game. Um, that was the image I was going for, actually. Okay. That, was, <laughs> that, that is that's good. I mean, you know, like the last time we we talked about him or, or, or thought about him was when we had that strange report that uh, he had been sitting in the Oval Office uh, when was it Michael Flynn or others were talking about having the military seize the voting machines. And this is how bizarre our world is. Rudy Giuliani was the voice of reason saying, no, Mr. President, you can't do that. No, no, no. do yeah. not. Do not send the army in to seize the voting booth. And after that, just pretty much nothing from Rudy. But you know, two things are really striking about this. One is how nuts it is that all this happened. And these people are not like in court. Yeah. I mean, I keep thinking back to Watergate, right? And if you right. think about yeah, Watergate, you know, some, some morons break into the Watergate. And then a lot of the president's men go to jail for covering it up and lying, you know, and perjuring themselves and trying to suborn other parts of the government to be part of the cover. You know, it's it almost seems quaint and small potatoes that people went to jail for that while 
these other guys are walking around loose after literally trying to, you know, sitting in and thinking about using the military to execute a coup in the United States of America. And we're all dithering about, well, can we subpoena them and should they be held in contempt? And, you know, oh, my God. I mean, talk about nostalgia for a better time when um, can we, can you know, we go the, back to third rate burglaries. Could we yeah, just go we, back to that kinder, gentler time when we worried we about go back that? to going to jail for third rate burglaries? Yeah, yeah. John remember, Mitchell did time. Yeah. You know, the attorney general of the United States did time, but now we're all kind of wringing our hands saying, well, is it okay to put Peter Navarro in contempt? I mean, my God, you know, there was a time when we understood that no, things like this meant that you went to jail and, and we've just lost that. But the other thing that strikes me is how small, I mean, Rudy was once America's mayor, but he, he's become a, a, you know, a, a shadow of himself, but how yeah. small and silly, all these people. I mean, we're, we're, we're having arguments on the, you know, in the House of Representatives of the United States about whether to hold in contempt a guy whose last major job was golf caddy. <laughs> I mean, it's an, you know, these are, this is such a, a comic opera full of knuckleheads. Uh, speaking of comic opera full of knuckleheads, I'm going to play this simply for the entertainment value. So apparently Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is you know, still searching for, you know, exactly what her brand is, she decided that she's just going to, you know, yell at people on the floor of the House. Remember during the State of the Union address, she's yelling and heckling along with Lauren Boebert, you know, you know, shouting at the president. Apparently she's like that, or apparently that works for her on social media or helps her raise money. I don't know what it is. So uh, yesterday, while they're debating this, uh, Jamie Raskin, Democrat Jamie Raskin from New York, is speaking and um, he's being heckled by Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's yelling at him on the House floor. You know, like you, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't put up with this, you know, on, on the schoolyard or, or, or certainly in a, in, a, in a classroom. But here's a member of Congress who has nothing better to do with him. She's yelling at Jamie Raskin and Jamie Raskin is just not having it. So here's Jamie Raskin uh, responding to Marjorie Taylor Greene's heckling. The general lady, I think, said something about the Russian hoax or uh, Russian collusion. I, I accept the heckling, Mr. Speaker, that that's all right. Because if she wants to continue to stand with Vladimir Putin and his brutal, bloody invasion against the people of Ukraine, she is free to do so. And we understand there is a strong Trump-Putin axis in the general lady's party. If she wants to continue to stand with Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, that is her prerogative. But please do it on your own time, forthwith. Okay, that, that's pretty good. I, I even like the, the, yeah, and the, the whole <laughs> gentle lady thing. But uh, you know, I, I mean, the, the fact is, you know, well, look, there is, there is a pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party, and she would certainly be it. Obviously, that's bad for their brand with all the atrocities and the war crimes and the pictures that we're seeing. So I wrote yesterday. You know, they a lot of the pro-Putin folks have figured that they need to shift. Uh, many of them have become anti-anti-Putin, um, mm -hmm. or. What do you think of of this whole, you know, feel free to disagree with me, the, the, the laundering of their pro-Putin position through Viktor Orban, Orban, which yes. which is, OK, we're not pro-Putin, but we love Vladimir Putin's number one European ally, Viktor Orban. So Viktor Orban gives us that sweet dopamine hit of autocracy without the dead bodies in the street, the genocide, you know, the, the, the murdered children and, and everything. But that seems to be the new flex. Uh, the, the fact that CPAC right. is choosing now to go to Hungary to you know, celebrate Orbanism in the middle of all of this. Boy, what, what an extraordinary self-revelation. Yeah, that, it's like be like the Democrats holding their convention in you know uh, Sandinista Managua or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. Um, but one thing that struck me, just to go back to Marjorie Taylor Greene for a minute, and one of the problems the Republican Party has, my kind of gut feeling about Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's just basically an unstable person. You know what? Yeah. I like Peter Weiner's phrase that he used about Trump and people like that. Um, emotionally disordered in some way. Yeah. And so even if you can sort of wave away green and say, look, this is a person with a lot of, you know, clearly with a lot of emotional baggage and a lot of problems, the other Republicans refuse to distinguish themselves as different from her. Like they, they don't get out there and heckle in the same way, but they say, you know, like basically they make these apologies. Well, I wouldn't have heckled, but you know, but I get why she did it. Or, you know, they're, I, I understood the message or something. They just can't, 
the the crazy wing of the GOP is the GOP in part because the the people who are genuinely kind of probably appalled and mostly sane, you know, simply step back and say, I can't criticize her because the, there are enough people who like people like her in my primary pool that I just can't afford to do it. And so the party by default becomes the party of people like green because other Republicans, I mean, that would have been a great moment for another Republican to stand up and say, you're out of order here. You know, you're, you, you don't speak what you're us. doing is wrong. Sit down. Um, you know, I don't agree with Jamie Raskin, but you're being an idiot and they just won't do it. But I, I think your point about laundering their kind of Putinism through, it's a really interesting point because they're anti, anti Putin, but also it's their kind of pro pro Putin they're, they they have it one step removed and say you know I I don't like Vladimir Putin I just happen to really like somebody who really likes Vladimir right Putin. right right you know it's like I'm not saying get a that, little bit of uh, deniability uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's you know and I'm it's one step removed and I'm not saying I like the guy but I do like the guy who likes the guy and and CPAC having you know meeting in Budapest is it's too on the nose. I mean, it's the kind of thing that that if if you know Saturday Night Live had done it during Weekend Update two years ago, you would have chuckled and said, "Oh, you know, low blow." Um, and yet here we are. You know, it's almost like a, like a, a um, ribbing them comes through. You know, you know, you guys are so crazy. You ought to have your you ought to go meet in Budapest. Right. And they went challenge accepted. Um, and I, and I think it, I, I've said for years that I don't take seriously the views about anything of people that go to CPAC. I, I got into fights with people about, you know, whether pro-lifers at CPAC really care that much about pro-life, whether the, you know, the education reformers really care about education. I think it's become a kind of giant carnival of kookery and grievance that, you know, and it actually makes sense to have it in Budapest. And, you know, maybe that's where it ought to stay. I, I was thinking that if you wrote a, a satirical novel, sort of like, you know, Christopher Buckley, a satirical novel about the right, um, you know, you, you might, you know, come up with a scene of them going to Budapest. Um, but, but these are tough times. It's hard, it's hard to come up with And your editor that would wrong. say that's a nah, little, that's a, you, okay. So yeah. this is a slight digression before we get into it, because, um, I, I want to talk about that vote where 63 Republicans voted against this, uh, resolution, you know, backing needle, but you know, you, you mentioned other Republicans should push back. Okay. So this Republican Senate primary in North Carolina, uh, you have the former governor, Pat McCrory, who is running against a Trump endorsed candidate, uh, Congressman Ted Budd. And he's actually running ads now linking Budd to Madison Cawthorn and to Vladimir Putin. I mean, he shows Bud praising Vladimir Putin as a very intelligent actor. He has a clip showing Madison Cawthorn calling, uh, you know, Vladimir Zelensky a, a, a thug. So here you have a leading Republican, former Republican governor of North Carolina running for Senate who is to kind of you know, ripping off the Band-Aid and going, OK, these guys are embarrassments to the party, um, uh, you know, turning their their uh, their their Trumpism into a into a liability. So, I mean, we'll see whether that works. But I, I was going to just that, say, I, I just want to put work? a pin in it. Well, let's put a pin in it because we know all the other crazy. So we're talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene being, you know, um, unhinged and, you know, psychologically uh, injured. True. But I, I think the larger point, though, is that. There is a more fundamental problem, and I want to talk about the debate that I know you got into uh, yesterday on social media um, after you commented on the fact that six me people, in a debate on social media. No, it does seem sort of it does seem sort of <laughs> redundant to say that. Right. But <laughs> six, 63 Republican congressmen voted against a relatively anodyne resolution talking about the unequivocal support for democracy and for NATO. And, you know, of course, there were the usual, uh, you know, anti antis out there, the turd polishers who were saying, well, look, there's only 63. That's only one third. The vast majority of Republicans still voted uh, for the resolution. But I, I think you made the point, though. Look, um, it's, uh, you know, this is perhaps I don't know whether you were making this point, actually, but whether this is you know, a, an ominous leading indicator when you have that many Republicans voting against something that feels like five minutes ago would not have been co controversial at this particular moment, at this moment, that you would have one third of the Republican caucus vote against that 
is um, I, I, I think an indication of, well, of how unhinged certain factions are of the Republican Party and how unreliable they are on issues well, of foreign policy. Yeah. And, and let's talk about it from the point of view of, you know, what professional political watchers would immediately note here, which is that Kevin McCarthy does not control his own caucus. Yeah. The, the future Speaker of the House literally unset because, you know, and those of us have worked in politics, you know this, Charlie, from long experience. Yes, there are moments when the leader of your caucus lets you take a walk. Um, lets you go off the reservation, cast, you know, doesn't whip a vote, whatever it is. On this, the idea that you would have this embarrassment where a third of your caucus is, d- draws attention to your party as basically being anti-NATO during a war crime-filled ram- Russian rampage in the middle of Europe tells you that on even something, and I, I think your word's exactly right, anodyne, something as anodyne as a, hey, you know, yay, NATO, it's yeah. good it's good that we have NATO, yeah. Yeah. that you can't get your caucus to, you know, um, 100 or you know, 99.9% that you give the, you give the couple of freaks and geeks, you know, they're, they're out because you can't ever control them. And, you know, hopefully they will be primaried or sent home, but that, that you lose a third of your caucus and have a needless self-inflicted wound on your party as the future speaker of the house tells you that someone else controls your caucus. And in my case, and what set off my old mm-hmm. friend, Jay Caruso, I said, well, this is pretty much Fox proof that Fox pretty much runs the, entertain- the, the Republican- entertainment, wing. the entertainment yeah. wing. And I quoted you, right. Yeah, the entertainment right, right. wing of the GOP runs the party. And, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, but if the, if the Democrats had had a similar vote on, you know, this for the Democrats, the equivalent would be something like, isn't it great that we have a Department of Education, mm-hmm. right? You know, and a third of the Democrats just peeled off against Pelosi. The Dems in disarray headlines would be all over the place. And it would be, look, you know, um, uh, the far left, you know, the Rose Rose Coalition controls the Dems. You know, the Bernie Sanders hyper-socialist tankies are running. Th- you, you get none of that. All of a sudden it's, you know, the, basically the weak beer answer you get is hashtag not all Republicans, right. which is just not an answer. Well, no, it's not an answer. But, but it, okay, so here's, here's the... And the, there's an image in my head here because people who make that argument can point to the polls showing the overwhelming majority of Republican voters support NATO, support Ukraine, et, et, et cetera. They point out that, you know, a strong majority of Republican elected officials also support Ukraine, support NATO. All of that is true. But we have lived through this before. And the image in my head is that cloud on the horizon, you know, that dark cloud. And it's coming our way. And, you know, in the past, we might have said, OK, we don't need to worry about that. But we've seen how these things come and they overtake the party. And the main reason why you need to take this seriously is the fact that not only do you have the entertainment wing of the party, which would you know, obviously include people like Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram, weirdly enough, not Sean Hannity at the moment. But you do have that that entertainment wing of, of the party taking this position. And of course, you have the former and perhaps future president of the United States who clearly um, provides aid and comfort to that wing. Uh, Which faction of the Republican Party is Donald Trump most likely to ally himself with? And we know the answer to that. So by definition, we know that we need to take it seriously. And also based on past practice, we've seen how the fringe becomes the mainstream. We've seen how the unthinkable becomes the thinkable and then becomes the orthodoxy and then becomes the absolute litmus test. So this whole, hey, you know, nothing here to see, 63 people, you know, 63 Republican elected officials vote against Fado, nothing to see, (laughs) nothing to see. No, bullshit. And the point you started with, which is that, well, you know, there's an overwhelming majority of Republican voters who support NATO and, and are on Ukraine's side and stand against Russia. That makes this vote even worse because it tells you that at least a third of the Republican caucus doesn't care what its own party thinks, which raises the question, which is what I was doing on social media, of who do they think their actual constituency is? Who are they making happy 
by voting this way. And they are clearly aiming at the entertainment wing, the Fox wing, the kook donor wing of the Republican and the very small, you know, nutball primary wing of the Republican Party. So, you know, again, if these were Democrats, the Dems and Disarray articles write themselves. But here you get the, well, you know, it's a handful and not all Republicans and uh, it's just some uh, some folks kind of, you know, uh, to, out to make it a walk. It's it's ridiculous. And you're absolutely right. It's a harbinger of, of what's going to come. Then this was my point about Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Raskin business. That wing of the party can always shout down the rest of the party right. and they are becoming the orthodoxy of the party. They are becoming, you know, I think one of the things I said that pissed everybody off was that you might as well just make the evening Fox lineup, the, the platform committee of the Republican party. Sure. They have some <laughs> disagreements among themselves, but basically, you know, you have three or four hosts who, who pretty much are telling Republican electeds what to do. And clearly those electeds respond to that instead of to polling data that overwhelmingly says that their own voters don't agree with them. Okay, so I, well, I want to talk about in, uh, just another example, a really dramatic example of the way that the crazy has become mainstream. Also want to get your take on, on exactly where we are at now in the war uh, in Ukraine. I think some people think that you and I have been arguing about this, but I don't actually think that we have been. But let's do this after this. This is Charlie Sykes, and I want to tell you about Famous Smoke Shop. A good cigar is a reward. It's a tradition. At Famous Smoke Shop, they know all about it, American-owned and independent. Famous Smoke is your neighborhood cigar shop, no matter where your neighborhood is. As a matter of fact, Famous Smoke Shop was recently named the best place to buy cigars online by both Cool Material and Cigar World. Now in their 83rd year, Famous Smoke continues to offer the authentic cigar shop experience, decades worth of cigar knowledge, a huge selection of premium cigars, and low prices that every cigar enthusiast will love. Famous Smoke Shop offers a huge selection of over a thousand brands to choose from. You'll find incredible deals on everyday cigars and highly rated classics, including Romeo, Monte Cristo, Acid, Macanudo, Oliva, and Fuente. Plus, Every purchase is backed by their 30-day Famous Freshness Guarantee. So if you want your cigars fresh and delivered fast, it has to be Famous Smoke Shop. I have to tell you, my wife and I had something that we wanted to celebrate the other night, and it seemed perfect to break out some of the cigars. I love the Macanudos, and we went out to the back porch, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. There's just sort of nothing like a cigar at the end of the day to celebrate, to celebrate some triumph or to just celebrate life, to celebrate spring. So here's an exclusive offer for my listeners. To save $20 off your purchase of $100 or more, go to famous-smoke.com. That's famous-smoke.com and use code BULWARK at checkout to save $20 off your purchase of $100 or more. You'll get your favorite cigars delivered direct from their humidor to yours. That's promo code BULWARK for $20 off your purchase at famous-smoke.com. Great cigar deals only at famous-smoke.com. And remember to use promo code BULWARK. Okay, we are back with Tom Nichols. Okay, we're going to get to Ukraine in a moment, but uh, you know we're talking about how the the crazy fringes become the mainstream. I think the most dramatic example of that right now, playing out in real time, is the way that that the QAnon obsession with child sex rings and pedophiles and groomers has now become kind of the go to line for elected Republicans. I mean, the, the whole Ted Cruz soft on pedophile line on, on KBJ or the fact that the Christopher Rufos of the world have aligned themselves with alt-right fringe figures to attack Disney and suggest that anyone who uh, opposes anti-gay legislation is a groomer is a pretty good indication of stuff that was sort of simmering out there in the you know far edges of the fever swamp and, you know, it's everywhere right now. It's coming out of Ron DeSantis's office. It's coming out of Republicans in the Senate. And you're seeing this on social media, a really extraordinary moment. So your thoughts on this whole flex where anyone who disagrees with you must be pro-pedophile or a groomer? Well, uh, I'll just put in a plug for the last book I wrote, 
which, you know, kind of predicted this, this craziness spreading because again, why, you know, why is this happening at all? It makes life interesting. We have this vast bored middle class, um, who just, you know, for whom trying to figure out local bond issues or tax rates or the things we used to vote on back when we were a not, you know, psychotic country, um, is too boring. And so this is, this is like the new hobby that people with too much time on their hands have descended into. And what the Republicans have figured out is there's a huge pool of votes to be harvested from that, um, that you can, you can't get people all excited. I mean, it's almost like you, you know, you can't get them excited even about the old red meat stuff of, um, you know, gay rights and abortion and all that stuff. Now you have to kind of pump it up to, you, you've got to turn that up to 11 and, um, you know, push it to pedophilia and, and, um, groomers and Disney. I mean, it's almost like the satanic panic of the 1980s. You remember that? Remember oh, yeah. this, this giant freak out the nation had that daycare centers were actually, um, and really what it was, was a psychological breakdown oh. in America about people feeling guilty about sending their kids to daycare while they went to work. Um, but you know, people ended up in prison for years, um, for these, you know, crazy, stories about repressed memories and satanic rituals and all kinds of, you know, complete nutbag stuff. Um, that was 35 years ago and it's happening again. But I think what's fascinating is that instead of being the party, uh, that I thought I joined when I was a young man of kind of the, the level, um, you know, stoic cold voice of reason, the Republican party has become this bunch of howling freaked out drama queens and you have guys who've said, hey, if that's what I have to do to stay in power, if I have to service that, you know, conspiracy addled bunch of loons in order to go to Washington and then never have to live near them again. Um, so be it. I'm sure Ron DeSantis is sitting there saying, eh, if that's how I get, get to be president. If at least works. I get to be president, yeah, you know, if, if, if it if, works, if, if, if it if works. It works. If but I think they're taking enough. a bet that then I think some of this, and I don't want us to get too wonky about it, but some of this is baked into the primary structure that the craziest voters because of low turnout in primaries and because of high motivation of these really, you know, craziest voters, um, there is a rational incentive for Republicans to run in these primaries, like the craziest, you know, you remember what Nixon used to say, right? Run to the right and then run to the center. Well, now it's not just run to the right. It's run to the run off the edge of the earth and, and scoop up as many votes as you can from the crazies and then hope that you can kind of, come back and actually, you know, run a general campaign. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like a, it's terrifying to me because it's a breakdown of, of anything like, um, an informed democracy. Yes. What I think is interesting is also the, the way in which the, the alt-right continues to be sort of integrated into all of this, uh, this culture wars. And again, this is very much a different trajectory than you might have had back in the, the 60s when, you know, William F. Buckley Jr. and others said, you know, the John Birchers need to go. We can't have you people here. You know, the anti-Semites need to be driven out of the, of the, the party. Well, now they're being invited in. OK, I have to ask you this because you're an expert. And I'm, this is not a gotcha because uh, until 24 hours ago, I had no idea what the word meant. Okay. So do mm -hmm. you know what, do you know what a global homo is? Uh, because I you, not. you, you're pushing a global homo agenda. Okay. I'm glad to hear that because I did not as well. So the reason this comes up is because Christopher Rufo, who is the guy who has been the quarterback in charge of all of the attacks on critical race theory has now pivoted. And now he is leading the attack on, 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 on gays and groomers and Disney and, and all of that. I mean, he's, he's an entrepreneur of, of outrage. He has a, a new aide named Armin Tooley, who used to be the president of the Young Republicans at the University of Washington. And this guy wrote me, I, I read about it in my newsletter today, wrote me a, an email over the weekend. And I don't need to go into the background of it. But it's interesting that th this is the guy that uh, Christopher Rufo has hired because until now, Armin Tooley's great claim to fame was this big controversy when he tweeted out an attack on the globo homo agenda of the Democratic Party. And people went, what, what do you mean globo homo? And he claimed, and this is like- the, Sounds like a Devo album. Well, this is th this is where you get into that alt-right, you know, lulls, like wink, wink thing. It goes, oh no, that doesn't mean global homosexual. That means, like, wait for it. Are you ready for it? 
globalized, homogenized. And, <laughs> and this has nothing to do with gay people. So I actually found a good description of this, you know, that ostensibly global homo is short for global homogenization, um, which is, you know, the conspiracy to destroy traditional culture and values and replace them with a sort of global corporate uniculture. But it's really actually used this way, at least not exactly. For those who've seized upon the term global means globalist and therefore Jews, well, homo means, well, homo, the slur. Some evidently worried that global homo is not gay sounding enough, so they add gayplex to it, as in global homo gayplex. <laughs> And so global homo has come to mean something like the global homosexual Jewish conspiracy to degenerate our culture up real good with drag queens and anal sex and possibly Ben Shapiro. Um, so anyway, so here's the guy, you know, Christopher why, Lupo goes, why you I do, want. Why you do this to me, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's Christopher Lupo goes, you know, who should I choose to be my right hand man? This guy. And now, so again, it's part now of the right is embracing these things. And the guy who was like five minutes ago was tweeting Pepe the Frog and had his his avatar picture of himself with the mother of the Gripers, you know, the, the really virulent uh, right winger, uh, Michelle Malkin. You know, now this guy is like right there and he's in the cockpit. And so this is, again, how does the extreme become mainstream and will there be any pushback? Will the great thinkers at the Manhattan Institute think, well, maybe Christopher Rufo is not the deep thinking scholar that we thought. Maybe this is a little bit toxic. No, they're not going to think that because the thing we have to talk about when we're talking about this, Charlie, is the notion of the attention economy. Yep. And, you know, this is about grabbing big chunks of the attention economy. And, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot of times about, you know, kind of how we came up and you know, how this group of young conservatives is different. But, you know, this is another case of, I'm sure that, you know, guys like Christopher Rufo are saying, this is how you become Christopher Rufo. This is how you become a name. This is how you become embedded in the intention economy. And you, you see this with this explosion of young conservatives who all believe that they are, um, they don't want to become George Will or William Buckley. That's, that takes too long and it requires too much talent. Um, but they want to be, reach that level of influence and notoriety. Um, they're almost like um, they want to be less toxic versions of Milo Yiannopoulos, where, you know, suddenly they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous, they're, they're having the time of their lives, they're getting big book deals, except without the big implosion that, that comes after it. And I, and I, I Which think, included, by the way, support for pedophilia. I, you <laughs> so know, I'm going <laughs> to point yeah. that out, but yeah. I yeah. think a lot of them have simply decided as, and this is their link to the Republicans, if these are the things I have to say in order to remain in the public sphere and have a big voice in the public square, then I'm just going to say crazy shit. That's what I'm going to do. And I mean, in some sense, this is completely detached from actual issues, from the right or left continuum of American politics, from nationalism versus globalism or populism versus elitism. This is about, um, you know, second stringers deciding, third stringers deciding this is how I am going to have a place in, in the public eye, I am going to have my moment. And, um, if I have to imply that people, you know, the Mitt Romney, you know, is supporting pedophiles, um, then that's what I'm going to do because that's my goal in life is to be somebody is to be in the public eye. Yeah. A lot of these people are really stoking up their regrets for when they're middle-aged and, uh, and that selling I, real estate yeah, one day. Yeah, yes. Something, something like that. I, I think that's, you know, this is going to sound to them like a couple of old men, you know, wagging their finger across the table, but they are storing up some regrets at a young age for things that, that I think they're going to wish that they they had been more circumspect about. I think so. Okay, so let, let's talk about um, the big story. Uh, I know you've written very, very extensively about it. And I, and, I, and I previously was saying that I think that some people on social media think that you and I were having an argument about it, and I really don't think so. I think that during something like this, there's a push and a pull. And I have been among those saying, we need to do more. We need to do everything we can short of starting a nuclear war. You, of course, have been you know, pushing back against the people who have been saying we need a no-fly zone and everything. So 
I, I, I don't think that there's a fundamental difference there. I, I think both those points of view are necessary. I think it's kind of the, you know, thesis and antithesis, yin and yang. But give me your sense of where we are at right now, knowing that I'm going to come back and ask the question, are we doing enough? So what is the state of this war right now as, as you see it? Well, let me just fire back at the people who keep trying to drag people like you and me into yeah. fights. Yeah. Because that's not helpful. You know, one of the people I don't disagree with very much either, including you, is um, Alex Vindman. And I yeah, know that okay. I don't disagree that much with Alex because I have sat at a table with him, you know, with a cup of coffee. And we have talked about this yeah. at length. And yet people keep saying, well, you know, what do you say yeah. to Alex? And what do you yeah. say to Charlie? And, yeah. You know, I, I I disagree with Gary Kasparov. We've, ha we've mm -hmm. actually argued about it on TV. Um, you know, but we are all on the same side. We are all allies in the same cause. Uh, for Ukraine and to restrain the Russians. And we are all trying to adopt uh, strategies that we think will work. And I, and I just will say to people listening, you know, don't, there are plenty of real fights that I want to have on social media, but I'd really appreciate people not trying to drag people who are all on the same side into social media and yelling, fight, 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 because that, that's mm -hmm. not really what this is about. Mm -hmm. um, do I think we're doing enough? Yes. Um, and I think we could even do more. We can speed up shipments of lethal weapons, you know, and lethal weapons as opposed to purely defensive stuff like flak jackets and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, more stingers, more javelins. It, it, this always comes back to the, but should we have sent the MiGs? I would have been okay with getting the MiGs there somehow, but we talked about it too much and we turned it into an issue and we handed that to the Russians because everybody involved, the Poles, us, the Germans, we all kind of talked it to death. I, I said recently in another um, context, I said, you know, the first rule of covert aid club is you don't talk about covert <laughs> aid club. Um, and so, you know, I was against the idea that we were going to let like this, this cockamamie idea, well, we'll fly the MiGs to Germany and then the Ukrainians will fly them out of Germany right into combat. You know, the Russians, that's really a dangerous thing to do. And just to explain to folks who don't do this for a living, the Russians would then say, these were attacks on Russian forces. We have identified where they originated from. Um, we are not going to hold NATO responsible. And NATO can say, well, go fuck yourself. Yeah. You know, but then you are in a situation that you didn't need to create for not a particularly large um, payback because what the Ukrainians really need are surface to air missiles right. and other things that will shoot down okay. stuff as S well as the S things. S-300. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. The Turks, when we couldn't get, you know, we Biden tried to get the S-400, tried to get it there. But the other thing they need is a way to destroy armor and artillery on the ground because artillery is what's really killing these people. You know, so this became like a, oh, you're either for the MiGs or you're a coward. Yeah. And foreign policy during a major war is complicated. So can we do more? Yeah, we can probably do more and quicker. But fundamentally, what we're doing are the right things. And I think what's going to end this where I, um, I did a talk last night at the Groton School. So mm -hmm. a wave mm -hmm. of anybody from the Groton mm -hmm. to the kids at the Groton School. They were great. But the question always comes up of, will sanctions end this war? No, sanctions will deprive Putin of a lot of oxygen to conduct this war more effectively. But what's really going to end this war is that the Russians are going to keep taking a lot of losses. And they're going to have to either escalate to some kind of, God forbid, weapons of mass destruction, or they're going to try and, you know, make a big push to hold on to some extra territory and then demand a negotiated settlement. And the thing that will help the Ukrainians the most are those weapons on the ground. The thing that will, and uh, Charlie, you know, I wrote about this in the Atlantic a few weeks yeah. ago. I took a lot of face shots for it, but a NATO intervention of any kind, anything that lets Putin claim that this is now a NATO intervention is going to save Putin's ass. He would love to lose. If he has to lose, he would rather lose to NATO in a kind of heroic one-on-one -on -one with Washington, where then he can negotiate and say, I, I faced down the great NATO alliance. I am the hero of Russia. Um, or he could also say, finally, the apocalyptic war with NATO that I always knew was coming, and we might as well just have it and get it over with. Jesus. But, but it's a stupid, stupid thing to say, well, Nate, and I think it's because 
and I'll flog a yeah. piece that's coming in next month's Atlantic. It's because we've forgotten about nuclear war and we've forgotten about the nuclear risks of the Cold War. And thank God Joe Biden hasn't, because I think he's he's guiding this, you know, with a pretty steady hand. I thought he I thought he kind of went off the rails when he did the oh he can't stay in power. And, okay, not a huge gaffe, but not the right moment for that particular expression, which was true and honest and emotional, but, you know, presidents have to be a little less emotional at times like that. Mm -hmm. um, but this notion that we can turn this into a big war and NATO could ride in like the cavalry, that's just, that's just nuts and it's irresponsible. So let's talk about these weapons. The S-300 is a very, very you know, powerful anti-aircraft system that can take out high-flying uh, airplanes. The the Ukrainians have made it very clear they really, really would want it. That clearly would be something that would meet the need. Um, it seems like the response to people who say we need to you know, close the airspace, we're not going to have a no-fly zone. Apparently, we're not going to give them the MiGs. So the S-300 or something equivalent to that seems to be the answer. Why are they not there right now? Yeah, I don't know. Um, this is where I don't know enough about the, the logistical trail and the approvals to get them there. And so, I, I mean, I could make up an answer, but I think it's always good for an expert every now and then to step back and say, I, I don't know, Charlie. I don't know why they're not there yet. See, this is your... This, but, okay. but notice, yeah. I just want to point out one thing. Yeah. Notice that it has gone, and, and wisely, Zelensky even has gone from no fly zone, which was not, which right. is a dangerous and bad idea, to close the skies, which is a different thing entirely. Um, you know, you can close the skies and, and make those skies unflyable, especially for the unbelievably craptacular Russian Air Force, um, you know, which is just I, whose whose low expectations I had for them have been met and then they got under them somehow. Um, so you can close the skies and make it, you know, exceedingly dangerous for the Russians to fly, but they are going to need those systems. And they still need the, I, I think one of the unsung heroes of this, um, you know, in terms of the equipment has been, not just the Javelin, but the British Enlaw. Um, oh, yeah, which has absolutely. It's been a remarkable thing, you know, that, that the Russians, I mean, it's almost like the Russians just didn't understand that they were fighting a 21st century adversary and they're paying for it. The Enlaw seems to be doing for tank warfare what the Longbow did back in the Middle Ages. It seems to change the rules of the battlefield. It has. And, you know, the ability of every infantry guy to be a, a one man tank killer with something light and portable is really a pretty remarkable revolution. I don't want to say a revolution in warfare because that always makes yeah. people at the Pentagon think uh, that they've discovered something new. But it is a, it's a quantum achievement in changing the battlefield, especially when you're fighting an enemy who thinks that tanks are you know, indestructible and that artillery is everything. And that this is changing things. So I'm, I'm going to go for a twofer here. I'm going to be over my skis as well as showing my age when I ask this question. Why have we not heard about the Exocet missile in terms of <laughs> in terms of ship killing, especially? Uh, <laughs> oh, Charlie, you know, my old friend. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the Falkland yeah. War. Back <laughs> at, at some point, I mean, is is that is that now an obsolete technology? Are there other uh, ship killing missiles that we could provide them that might defend Odessa? I, uh, I'm glad we both remember the age of sail. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> I knew it. I just um, walked right into it. But there are ship killing missiles, and um, Biden's going to provide them. Um, that that That's there are going to be um, anti ship defenses, and I actually haven't seen the you know the bill of lading here. But the last go around, my understanding was the Biden administration said that yeah that they're going to provide anti ship defenses, and again the Russian Navy. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't want to speak directly to the enemy and give them advice, but dudes, when you pull a ship into an enemy harbor that you don't control, the ship's going to get blown up. Um, and yet they're doing this. I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm not a professional Navy man. And, you know, I taught at a Naval War College for a lot of years and I'm just an interested observer here, but pulling a ship into a port that is not under your control in a hostile environment and, and then being surprised when the enemy who controls that port blows up your ship. I mean, this is this is just rank incompetence at all levels. And I think when the Ukrainians are even better armed for those kinds of moments, it's even going to get worse. And there is one danger I want to add to this, yeah. that the danger that the Russians are going to do something really off the hook actually increases with 
the more poorly they're doing on the battlefield. So we need to brace ourselves for that because they are losing on the battlefield and they're taking remarkable levels of casualties and equipment losses. And I'm not sure Putin, you know, we kind of, Admiral Kirby the other day kind of trolled Putin about this, where he's like, I'm not sure that President Putin really is getting, you know, the truth from his own guys, um, which to an intelligence officer is a grave insult. Um, but he may not be. And I'll be curious to see when somebody finally comes in with the butcher's bill and says, you know, this many tanks, this many KIA, this many WIA, this many airplanes lost, this many ships sunk, that um, he's he's going to want to change the dynamic. Out by, there by doing what? What are you most concerned about? I mean, are, are, are we talking, we're talking about <laughs> chemical weapons, tactical nuclear weapons? What? What, are, what, what, are, you, what are you most concerned about? What, are, what is the most likely... Bad I did warn early on that he would start committing war crimes and atrocities to try to draw the foul, to, to intimidate the Ukrainians, maybe to provoke NATO. So the war crimes, I, I figured, would be the first, the go-to move. And that's turned out to happen. I wonder if the chemical provocation got um, short-sheeted by the Biden administration and the Europeans, who I think have been really great on this, by the way, by revealing intelligence, saying yeah. a chemical attack's coming, it's going to happen, brace yourself for it. And then Putin goes, well, shit, you know, like, you know, now there goes a lot of our preparation for a false flag event. A tactical nuclear weapon, I'm sure Putin has thought about it because he's that kind of guy. If there is going to be one, because this is what made me think of it when you talked about the Black Sea, use of a nuclear weapon at sea makes a lot of sense in that sense. I mean, insofar as anything makes well, sense. What would the target be? It, well, it could be, it could be um, outside of a Ukrainian port, but far enough at sea so that it's not actually landing on land and creating a lot of radiation. So pretty much um, like so a demonstration, probably, just like I'm, yes, I'm going to show I'm prepared right. to do it. Don't push me any right. further. Okay. And and yet I've done it in a place where no actual territory has had, you know, that it's it's within sight. It hurts a lot of people. It might take out some ships. It does some damage. But the actual, you know, target location is a, just a grid out on the water somewhere. Yeah. I'm hoping that he's not that stupid and crazy. And I'm hoping as well that there are people, even in a Kremlin as tightly controlled by him, that are saying, uh, look, you know, Mr. President, I'm your guy and I've been with you all along, but you need to take a nap and think about this one, you know, before we're going to go down this road. I suspect rather what you're going to get. And I think that's a very low probability event. So let me just say that before anybody panics out there. Mm -hmm. But I, my expectation is that the butchery, I mean, he, if he really has decided I, I can't leave this war without Mariupol, then yeah, he's going to flat. I mean, it's already 90% destroyed. If he, if he has to control that by reducing it to dust, then he certainly will do it. And again, we need to be braced for it because I think he actually knows that atrocities get this coverage and he's trying to shake the Ukrainians and shake the West. Uh, there's one other thing I want to, and then I'll stop. That, the that doesn't Charlie. seem to be working. Yeah. No, it's not working. Yeah, yeah. The other thing, though, is, and a friend of mine who's got you know some pretty deep Russian knowledge and and um, whose views on this I respect. He pointed out to me the people in Bucha, for example, they the Russians may have been massacring them not because they were defiant Ukrainians, but because they were Russian speakers, and that the Russians said, "You traitors did not welcome us as liberators," um, and you know here's what we do to traitors, uh, and that that's a warning to the people in the Russian speaking areas they already controlled as well, you know, to let the story get out to, um, you know, to people inside Russia that, um, this is how anything but absolute okay. support will be dealt with. Okay. This, this leads me to my, my final question. I, I promise, um, because you're a Russian speaker and you are an, you actually are an expert in many things, Russian. There've been a lot of uh, polls out showing that Putin has overwhelming support for this war. How reliable, how credible are public opinion polls taken in Russia right now with this atmosphere where, where the question seems to be, and I saw somebody on Twitter making this point, people saying, uh, do you support the war um, or are you willing to say something that might get you 15 years in jail? What do you, what is your sense of this? Because this seems to be shaping a lot of conventional wisdom and reactions that, that the Russian people are solidly behind this, but I don't know. 
I'm trying to imagine a free, fair, secure poll being conducted in this current environment. What do you think? Well, there's a few ways to peel that onion. One is, um, yeah, polls in Russia are, you know, uh, lol, uh, as the kids would say, you know, um, LOL. But on the other hand, there are kind of guerrilla pollsters who have managed to do polls even during, you know, under Putin, who are still finding that, yeah, the polls may not be accurate, but the sense they're conveying is accurate, that people are rallying behind Putin here because propaganda is effective. But I will add that you have to look at those polls through a generational lens. Older people are solidly behind Putin because they've always been behind Putin. Um, You know, these are the guys that are now, you know, uh, sad to say my age, you know, or 60-ish, people over 50 anyway, um, who are, you know, pretty pissed about the fall of the Soviet Union. And they're totally believing the, the propaganda they're getting on Russian television, which is crazy, by the way. Um, you know, Julia Davis, one of our friends on yeah. Twitter there who spends her day watching Russian television, she's pointing out that the, the hosts on Russian TV are yelling at pro-Putin guests for not being harsh enough. Yeah. Um, you know, so you've got that dynamic happening in, on Russian TV. And for those older Russians, that is their world. They're like the Fox viewers of Russia. They don't know anything else but what they're seeing there. Younger people who are not going to answer questions from scary strangers and who do know how to get on the internet and do know how to get the news. That's a completely different thing. So I'm guessing that you would see a gigantic generational split as well as an urban rural split, you know, where Putin lives in Moscow, there is not going to be a lot of support for this war. But when you get out to the, you know, what the Russians call the Gubinka, you know, the, the boonies. Yeah, they're very pro Putin because they're all miserable and poor and they blame the West instead of the guy that's been running their lives for 22 years. And so I guess what I'm saying is you can't look at a figure like 70% and say, wow, three quarters of the Russian people are in favor of this. What you have is big support in the boondocks, big support among the old people, basically the past support, the Russian, the people that represent the Russian past support Putin. The people that would have represented the Russian future who are now leaving in droves are against the war. Tom Nichols, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Uh, You can read Tom's work in The Atlantic, uh, his newsletter, Peacefield, or follow him on social media. Tom, thanks for coming back on the podcast. Thanks, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again. juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth, the Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help with special guest Chris Browning. You know, I'll give a shout out. I have two co-workers, Mandy, who love your podcast. They found out about me podcasting because of the last time I was on on your podcast, That's Brown it. Ambition. <laughs> we outed you. We yeah, you did. So you. spread it out a little bit further. Chances are if you work in an office with black women, Brown Ambition <laughs> is somewhere. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.